Until bound by the iron link, we are not a dominion in fact. We are a great nation. And we can become one of the greatest nations in the universe if we preserve it. Five years and seven days after Confederation, Parliament was just about to be dissolved. It was time for a new election. John A. MacDonald hoped to hold on to power on the strength of a bold plan. Some people said it was an insane plan to build a railway all the way to the Pacific. It would complete what Confederation had begun, to create a dominion, sea to sea, and to keep the Americans out of the Canadian West. I am commanded by His Excellency, the Governor General, to acquaint this Honorable House that it is the pleasure of His Excellency that the members thereof do forthwith attend him in the Senate Chamber. to do is look at the continental map and there it is perfectly plain for anyone to see Canada belongs to us by nature should be brought over without violence or bloodshed it is quite evident to me that the United States is a resolve to do all they can short of war to get possession of the Western Territory and we must take immediate and vigorous action to counteract it. Until the railroad is built to British Columbia and the Pacific, this dominion is a mere geographical expression. And the uh, railroad? Well, once we get the contract, we give out a pretense that an all-Canadian route is being constructed north of Lake Superior. By this means, we calm public opinion. Then? Then, we proceed as we will. Uh, Monsieur Counselor. As long as I live, never will a damned American company have control of the Canadian Pacific. Manipulate. That's how it's done. We just quietly manipulate the annexation of British North America to the United States. You may depend upon it. We will see that Canadian interests are protected and that no American ring will be allowed to get control over them. This grim baronial mansion, here on the top of Mount Royal, bore the Gothic name of Ravenscrag. It was the home of Sir Hugh Allen, the richest man in Canada. He owned the country's leading steamship line and now he had designs on John A. Macdonald's railroad. If he could get to build that road all the way to the Pacific, he would stand at the head of a transportation colossus. But uh, Hugh Allen was not the only one who wanted to build the Pacific Railway. There was his Montreal group, and there was also a Toronto group, headed by Senator David McPherson, one of Macdonald's political cronies. Actually, the Prime Minister favored Allen as the man best equipped to bring his national dream to reality. And that was probably one of his great mistakes, because behind Allen stood the very people the railroad was supposed to keep out, the Americans. So there was a series of meetings between Allen and a young Canadian expatriate named George McMullen, who spoke for the Americans. Their correspondence tells us the kind of deal they made. In return for a large block of stock, Sir Hugh Allen was prepared to deliver the country and its railroad into Yankee hands. I want to make it perfectly clear to you and to your American friends that I am not interested in the political aspects of the situation. I understand. But it has already been said to me by a member of cabinet that it would be a, a pity if a work of such importance as the railroad were entrusted to foreigners. But you are not a foreigner, Mr. McMullen. You are a Canadian. And that, at this moment, is what intrigues. That catches the imagination. I believe we must proceed directly with the formation of a company. Exactly. It must, of course, look Canadian. In name and form, it must be so. We must consider the first of our problems. 
Cartier. I agree. Monsieur Cartier controls the parliamentary action of 44 members from Quebec, and there is an election coming up. I have already been at work winning over a considerable slice of that number. The politics are complicated, but the means are very straightforward. I suggest a fund. Something provided by American friends. Say 30,000. 40. To be distributed among persons whose support would be desirable. I like things in writing, Macmillan. That can be arranged. Good. Then I can see nothing further standing in our way. Good night. Your position to our plans, at least, is well defined. So, on December 23rd, 1871, Allen and Macmillan's principals signed a formal secret agreement. They made quite a pair, the aging robber baron of Ravenscrag and the 27-year-old speculator from Picton, Ontario. McMullen was a born promoter. He had that kind of agile mind that leaps from project to project, uh, growing aphrodisiacs for the Chinese, of all things, and uh, backing the development of a long-range cannon for the American army and inventing a process for preserving railroad ties, anything that would make him a dollar. Very few of these schemes worked out, but George McMullen certainly earned his place in Canadian history. By the early summer of 1872, the election campaign was in full swing and the Tories were desperately short of funds. In those days, the money was used for what was called treating the voters, a drink, a dinner, a $5 bill. All very illegal and all very common among both parties. You know, I, I read in the press that enormous sums are being lavished on this campaign. By us, it's not said. But I will say this. If any of you out there have any money to spare and you wish to spend it on us, we'd be more than grateful for the gift of an awning. <laughs> you know, they talk of hotly contested ridings, and I think this must be one of them. Joke as you like, John A., but I got offered money to throw my vote. And I hope you turned it down, sir. The Grits couldn't buy my vote either. <laughs> but money did talk. Hugh Allen had taken the Americans' funds and he had shrewdly applied them all up and down the north shore of the St. Lawrence. Suddenly, Cartier was confronted by the electors of his Montreal ward. Unless the Pacific Railway contract was given in the interests of Lower Canada, and that meant to Sir Hugh Allen, Cartier would lose all support. He was already suffering the ravages of Bright's disease. All he could do was to appeal to MacDonald for help. Very well. Very well. Something must be done, and we must do it. Now. Hugh. Sir? This is a wire. To Cartier. Under the circumstances, I authorize you to assure Alan that the influence of the government will be exercised to, to secure, secure him the position of president. Other terms to be as agreed on between Toronto interests and you, Abbott. The whole matter to be kept quiet until after the election. He wants an answer. Here is my answer. I am not satisfied. Not satisfied at all. You have your legal advisor with you. Why don't you go away and draw up a response to this wire that does satisfy you? Very well, Sir George. We shall return with an itemized answer in writing. 
Are you not going to help us in our elections? How much do you calculate you'll want? With the oppositions against me, well, I really cannot say, but perhaps one hundred thousand dollars. Perhaps we should have that in writing to Here yet. Yes, sir. Well, here in Ontario, you've recently elected a new premier. I can't remember his name. Here we have in black and white what I believe you need of me. I quote. Friends of the government will expect to be assisted with funds in the pending elections, etc., etc. It then goes on to mention more immediate requirements. Those funds to be distributed thus. Sir John A. MacDonald, 25,000. Honorable Mr. Langerie, 15,000. Sir G.E.C., 20,000. Sir John A. MacDonald, additional 10,000. Honorable Mr. Langerie, 10,000. Sir G.E.C., 30,000. Uh, this is more pertinent to my side of the story. In it, to be brief, I request that the offer of the presidency be made firm and binding, uh, plus other requests, such as my own choice of directors, etc. So that it is what I want and what you want, if you please. Yes. The voting was just about to begin when MacDonald finally heard from Cartier, and he was appalled. He couldn't go to Montreal to straighten out the mess, so he wired a curt message. His original telegram of July 26 must remain, and this is the phrase he used, the basis of the agreement. The the agreement. Up? The word would return to haunt him. Well, Sir Hugh Allen withdrew those two damning letters, but uh, he didn't withdraw his financial support. And even at that, the Tories under MacDonald just barely squeaked in. And poor old Carchet was defeated. That was the end of a distinguished political career. It also meant that Johnny MacDonald would have to struggle with the problem of the railway alone. It was time for a few distressing truths. Months ago, MacDonald had ordered Sir Hugh Allen to cut all connections with Americans. On October 7th, Allen admitted he had disobeyed those orders. A few weeks later, he revealed to the Prime Minister just how much money he'd advanced the Tories. Worse still, word of the agreement was beginning to leak out. Hugh Allen had further shocks to dispatch from his Gothic perch on Mount Royal. He mailed his expense account to McMullen. Not the agreed 40,000, later raised to 50, but a whopping $350,000. And to top it all, on October 24th, he finally broke the news to the Americans that he'd have to dump them after all. On Christmas Eve, a furious McMullen landed in Montreal, but Allen would not budge an inch. And so McMullen had to leave, but not quite empty-handed. He climbed these stairs on the afternoon of New Year's Eve, 1872, and he headed for the office of the Prime Minister of Canada. And we know from the later testimony of both men pretty well what went on. If George McMullen couldn't get compensation, he meant to have revenge. What are these? Letters from Sir Hugh Allen. And um, what's my interest in them? Why, those are letters, Prime Minister, to some very well-known American railroad gentleman. And so? From Sir Hugh Allen, sir. You said that. Prime Minister, I'm... 
I'm delivering Sir Hugh Allen directly into your hands. I can't believe you don't want him. I thought I had him. No, sir. You do not. Go on. Prime Minister, you must be aware of certain funds delivered during the last election to some of your colleagues. Well, more, Mr. McMullen. I hang on your words and you deliver nothing. What more need I say, sir, than you know what I speak of? And here is proof of where that money came from. What money? The funds delivered during the last election. Now, there's no need to get excited, Mr. McMullen. Will you have a drink? No, thank you. Uh, perhaps if you could uh, read a little of what you have there in your hands. My eyes and the light, and I'm very tired. This dated June 12th last. It is written to myself. It will not be necessary for either you or I to talk to the government in Ottawa. I believe I have got the whole thing arranged through my French friends by means you are aware of, and we now have the pledge of Sir G that we will have a majority and other things satisfactory. I have told you all along that this was the true basis of operations. It then goes on to say... That will do, Mr. McMullen. Now, I have no inclination to enter into a long discussion with you about the character of Sir Hugh Allen, nor his motives nor his means. But I will not have you imply that he was engaged in bribery with my government, because that is preposterous. Then if Mr. Allen is not engaged in bribery, he is engaged in the swindle of the century. What swindle, Mr. McMullen? Wouldn't you call it a swindle to accept almost $400,000 for the purpose of political cultivation and end up putting it in your own pocket? Yes, I would. $400,000, yes. And whose was it? All I can say is that it was American money. Prime Minister, you have an agreement with Sir Hugh Allen. Whether you like it or not, that agreement includes American interests. Now, either you must stick to that agreement, or you must get rid of Hugh Allen altogether. Now. Mr. McMullen, I'm not at all sure that I can help you. Obviously, you have a problem, and uh, it distresses me for your sake that uh, Sir Hugh Allen has not been more honest with you. You mention American capital, and that amazes me. So far as I am concerned, Sir Hugh could never have obtained what he wanted. The people of Canada would not allow it. How can he, or you for that matter, imagine that I, or my government, would entertain the idea of American capital being involved? This, sir, is a Canadian venture. And as far as it seems to me, that's the end of it. You must know, sir, that I'm quite willing to let those letters go elsewhere. Oh. Well... I did not say I was not interested in looking at them, but uh, of course I can't peruse them all at once. Um, put it this way. I will meet within the next weeks Mr. Abbott. I am correct. Mr. Abbott handles Sir Hugh's affairs. Uh, we will uh, see what I can do on your behalf. Does that suit you? Very well. Well, I think we can say good night on that. I wish you a happy new year, and uh, I will not add prosperous. It might be unseemly, but I will say happy new year.
So, for the first time in the history of this country, and indeed the only time, somebody tried to blackmail the Prime Minister. It looked as if John A. MacDonald had finally been backed into a corner. For the better part of a year, he'd been telling himself and the country at large that Sir Hugh Allen was the only possible choice to head the Pacific Railway Company. And now this same Allen stood revealed as a liar, a double dealer, and worst of all in, in McDonald's eyes, a Yankee lover. And this was the man who was setting off for London to enter in the most delicate financial negotiations to get backing for the largest railway in the world. If the financial people knew what McDonald knew, the whole railway project would collapse like a soap bubble. He heard from the Americans within a month, and <laughs> they wanted to know if McDonald had any objections, if they would petition Parliament for compensation for Allen's double dealing. Well, McDonald had every objection in the world. That's the last thing he wanted. So he had only one recourse, really, that was to buy them off and get hold of those damning letters. But Johnny McDonald would have no clear idea how much his enemies knew until the evening of April 2nd, 1873. The speaker recognizes the honorable member for... It Sherman. was Lucius Seth Huntington who rose to deliver the motion that MacDonald and the Tories had feared speaker, for so long. I would like to make the following motion. That as a member of this house, having stated in my place that I am credibly informed and believe I can establish by satisfactory evidence that... In anticipation of the legislation of the last session as to the Pacific Railway, an agreement was made between Sir Hugh Allen and certain other Canadian promoters and one Mr. G. W. McMullen, acting for certain United States capitalists, whereby the latter agreed to furnish all the funds necessary for the construction of the contemplated railway, that an understanding was come to between the government and Sir Hugh Allen, that Sir Hugh Allen and his friends should forward a large amount of money for the purpose of aiding the election of ministers and their supporters the ensuing general election, and that he and his friends should receive the contract for the construction of the railway. Shame! 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 The story was out in the open at last. Lucius Huntington moved that a committee be appointed to inquire into all circumstances connected with the construction of the Pacific Railway. The Pacific scandal had begun. There was a brief silence. The motion was defeated. But the next day, MacDonald himself was forced to set up an investigating committee. He knew that not much investigating could go on because the two key witnesses were in England. Carchet and rapidly failing health and Allen still looking for railway backers. They didn't call John A. MacDonald old tomorrow for nothing. He was playing for time, and for a while he was succeeding. The investigating committee got so entangled uh, with red tape that it accomplished nothing. And that could mean a safer royal commission of MacDonald's own choosing. But then came the worst possible news from England. Sir Hugh Allen had utterly failed to get financial backing for the Pacific Railway. And the old partnership of Cartier and MacDonald was no more. The body of Georges Etienne Cartier was shipped back to Canada in June and buried on this spot in Montreal. He was one of the architects of this country, the only blot on a distinguished career, his relationship with Hugh Allen. And so MacDonald lost his friend, confident, political comrade in arms, and strong right hand at the worst possible moment. By July 17th, the newspapers had the whole story. 
names and cash amounts. Political dynamite, with a prime minister absent on holiday. The public was thunderstruck. This was Canada's first national scandal. Donald learned of the press leak from a note scribbled by a Tory colleague. And then he simply vanished from sight. Not even his wife knew where he was. There were rumors of suicide. His cabinet was frantic. Parliament was to reconvene in just over three weeks. By the time those three weeks were up, McDonald was back here in Ottawa and back in fighting trim. They had one incredibly stormy day in Parliament, and then the Committee of Inquiry totally collapsed and Sir John got his Royal Commission. And the hearings were held here in the East Block in a committee room very like this one. Some of the key witnesses would not be heard from. McMullen, for instance, was hiding out in Chicago, and a lot of those who did take the stand couldn't seem to remember very much. You had the spectacle of prominent politicians and astute businessmen fumbling about uh, with their testimony, uh, talking about letters that had been destroyed and files that are missing and mumbling weasel phrases like, uh, not to the best of my recollection, and I don't think I could have said that, that sort of thing. So it's easy to see why Johnny MacDonald was so anxious to replace a parliamentary committee of inquiry with a royal commission. The cartoonists had a field day. John A. Macdonald, prosecutor, defendant, and judge. October, the commission slowly ground to a halt with no official report or comment. But the evidence clearly showed MacDonald guilty on one humiliating charge. The Prime Minister, who was also the Justice Minister, had used money illegally in the election. He had three choices. He could resign immediately, he could call an election, let the country decide, or he could go to Parliament and fight it out in the House, where he'd suffer the jibes of the Liberal leader Alexander Mackenzie. Unless some sinister object was to be obtained, there could be no reason whatsoever for the government to refuse submission of this contract. I say refuse submission. But of it this wasn't Mackenzie that MacDonald feared. When will Blake speak? It is known. I must know. I must know. I, must know. I guess. I cannot speak until Blake has spoken. Why is he holding back? Accordingly, they resisted. What does he know? Of any measure intended Did you say something? To purify our electoral system. Now, would I be judging them too harshly? Eh? If I said that the only possible motive that could be fairly attributed to such a course was that they had already resolved to carry the elections at all hazards, even if improper means had to be used. We are asked to believe that those obligations to Sir Hugh Allen were only obligations of time. And the contributions, the contributions of a friend. Tory support was dwindling. All all, Some members, such as Donald Smith of Manitoba, remained uncommitted to the chagrin of MacDonald and his colleague, Charles Tupper. Have we got Smith? Well, it's hard to say. He didn't help that as much when you talked to him last night. I don't remember what he said. You got his backup. Oh, well, he can be an awful old woman at times, but he has always voted with us. Let's hope he continues to. Mr. Speaker, we are being asked to ignore all logic, all inference from the evidence placed before us. 
We are being asked to declare that circumstances which point to one thing do not point to that thing at all. We are being asked to vote that black is white. And still, not a word from McDonald. The strain would be intolerable until he could know what final damning revelation the liberals might make until the House had heard from that consummate orator, Edward Blake. We want to know, and the country wants to know, the temper in which Parliament is to deal with this great question. All right, I have listened to the long speech of the honorable member with a sense of sympathy. A sense of sympathy in which his friends must join while this great question which is before the House as to whether the Prime Minister of this country, wishing money, met a great public contractor who wished for the contract. Whether the one got the money and the other the contract. While well, this great question, which has convulsed the country and startled the world, was under consideration, that the government should put forth a man who spoke but lightly of the great Has uh, Mr. Blake spoken yet? Then I will have to. Sir? But that has been sufficient evidence of an improper understanding having existed. Blake. Donald is going to speak tonight. The Prime Minister had finally seen through liberal strategy. There would be no further revelations. Blake's plan, apparently, had been to delay his broadside until MacDonald was beyond coherent speech. And from the look of things, it might still work. to see me, Sir John. Did I? Your secretary said you did. Oh, yes. Um, during my speech, be a good fellow and uh, organize one of the page boys. <laughs> Delighted. Brandy and soda? No, no, no. Gin. At least let it look like water. We must... Uh, confuse the opposition. With anything? Just as it comes. Nine PM, Monday, November third, eighteen seventy three. Every member was in his place except the exiled member from Provence, Louis Riel. People had been pouring into the capital all day to hear the anticipated duel between John A. MacDonald and his doer adversary, Edward Blake. I recognize the And then the moment came. Regardless of fatigue and alcohol, MacDonald would have to make the speech of a lifetime. Mr. Speaker, I had not intended to address the House on the amendment in your hands at present. My testimony in this affair has already been given under oath to the Commission. To them, I have endeavored to uh, state the whole of our case and to reveal everything. Therefore, I do not see how it can accord with the ordinary rule if I were to supplement that statement given under oath with another statement here, not 
given under oath. However, I have been taunted, oh no, not in this house, but uh, I have been taunted in the press and uh, elsewhere to the effect that I have been withholding my statement, that uh, I have been withholding my statement and that I am afraid to meet this house. But I am not afraid to meet this house. For here I stand. He would stand there, electrifying the house for five hours. And by the time the clock had ticked its way past midnight, MacDonald had moved from defense to attack. Oh, I knew I would have a hard battle to fight. And I did what I could for the purpose of getting money to help in the election. I, a hard battle. For I would have to counteract the whole force of the honorable gentleman opposite, legitimate and illegitimate. See, my party is not the same means of doing things as the honorable gentleman opposite. Have many of espionage who'll pick your lock and steal your pocketbook. Why, if I had all these, I might have been as strong as the honorable gentleman opposite. But we were fighting an uneven battle with the honorable gentleman opposite, who simply made stealing a virtue. <laughs> A conspiracy from the beginning, and yes, it was a conspiracy. The honorable member for Shefford said he had obtained certain documents. How? How did he get those documents? Well, I would ask each of the honorable members to ask himself. Where did uh, Mr. G. W. McMullen? The American agent of an American company who was in correspondence with Sir Hugh Allen, where did he get the papers with which he came to us, attempting to levy blackmail upon us? That was in December, and I told him to go to... <laughs> well, I did not say anything unseemly to him at the time, but I did ask him to go... <laughs> out of my office. <laughs> Well, Mr. McMullen went to Sir Hugh Allen, and he did levy blackmail upon him. That is not an hypothesis on my part, Mr. Speaker, for we know that Hugh Allen promised McMullen $17,000 for those papers, and that was money he was raised to his hand. But the honorable member for Shefford gave McMullen something more. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it is utterly without foundation. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member for Shefford bought those papers. It was confirmed by none other than his guide, philosopher, and friend, the editor of the Montreal Herald, who said he bought those papers. I never got any information from Mr. McMullen until long after I'd made my charges in this house. Long after. And the statement of the right honorable gentleman is utterly without foundation, and I will say further. At the statement he made a few moments ago that I was influenced here by foreign gold and that foreign gold had been used in my election is so utterly unfounded, so false in every particular, foully false, that I challenge the right honorable gentleman to the combat! <laughs> Well, it's very evident I hit a sore spot. <laughs> the House had not seen MacDonald in this form for many months. He seemed to be drawing on a hidden well of energy. Now he knew that Edward Blake would follow with a devastating attack. And so he was determined to give his listeners a speech they would never forget. He had to, because if he couldn't rally his party, 
he couldn't remain as leader. There's been a great deal of talk about monies spent by us in the election, but I can tell you of one gentleman opposite who spent $26,000, and I can prove it. Others, too, spending between $30,000 and $5,000. I got the affidavits in my desk. Hear, hear. I say, hear, hear. Ah, oh, we hear the honorable gentleman opposite crying, hear, hear. One of our offenders, I can also prove payment to an elector on his behalf. Mr. Speaker, not a penny went out of my pocket. Oh, well, you know, if a man's not got a pocket, his wife has. <laughs> It was half past one in the morning when MacDonald, in a fever pitch, reached the climax of his speech. Can this House truly believe that my government is guilty of any of these charges? No. I challenge the House. I challenge the country. I challenge the world to read the Charter. Read the charter, read it, line by line and line and word for word. And they will find nothing in it which degrades the life of this nation, this dominion. They will find in it nothing of favor to one man over any other. And I am confident that the people of Canada will rally to us, notwithstanding the many errors and the many failings of my life. I appeal to the people of Canada. Nay, I appeal to a higher court even than that. I appeal to the court of my own conscience. And the court of posterity. Mr. Speaker, we now leave this case to this House with every confidence that they will weigh it against other fortunes than my own. I believe I can say there does not exist in Canada a man who has given more of his time, more of his heart, more of his wealth, more of his intellect, more of his powers, such as they may be, for the good of the dominion of Canada. <laughs> Exhausted Prime Minister, this was a personal triumph. But now, at two o'clock in the morning, the House still sitting, it was Edward Blake's turn to rise. And he would go at it for another five hours, right into the next afternoon and evening. Blake was icily dispassionate. He had an ability to cut right to the bone. And the Liberal Party had given him the difficult task of counteracting the emotional effect of McDonald's speech. Mr. Speaker. The right honorable gentleman who has just addressed the House for more than five hours has, in a long parliamentary experience, 
learned how to conduct a weak case, as no man is better suited to know than himself. <laughs> <laughs> and so he throws himself upon the decision of this house, upon the integrity of its members, and upon the intelligence of its people. Fine words, fine sentiments, to which my short answer is that when the right honorable gentleman was called upon to vindicate before the people his policy, when he was called upon by reason and argument to sustain his course and to prove his title to the confidence of this country during the late election, it was not to these high and elevating sentiments he appealed. It was not upon the intelligent judgment of the people he relied, but upon Sir Hugh Allen's money. <laughs> of corruption. This night or tomorrow night will see the dawn of a brighter and better day in the administration of public affairs in this country. Sir, you will not heal the festering sore by healing the skin above it. You must lance it and cleanse it. The honorable member... For Blake finally finished. But had he been able to cancel out the effects of McDonald's passionate appeal? If the Liberals could get only four votes from the new members from Prince Edward Island, there might be an almost evenly divided house. In the matter of expressing confidence in the present government, I must declare my opposition. It was an hour past midnight. Now the fate of the government was in the hands of the one influential figure yet to declare himself, the independent member for Selkirk, Donald Smith. Mr. Speaker. You, to begin with, allow me to say that after long and uh, deliberate consideration, I cannot believe the First Minister accepted Sir Hugh Allen's money with any corrupt motive. <laughs> and not only must I say that I believe the leader of the government did not accept Mr. Allen's money from corrupt motives, but also that he could not. That as a man of honor, he would not. <laughs> Indeed, I would be most willing to declare my intention of voting for the government on this matter. I said I would be willing. Could I do so conscientiously? Mr. Speaker, it is with great regret that I cannot do so, for though I feel there has been no corruption, I sense there has been a very grave impropriety, and therefore it is my intention to declare myself in opposition. the government, this was the end. MacDonald wouldn't allow it to go to a vote. The government resigned the next day, and he went into opposition. And ever since then, there's been an argument about how much he knew of events as they happened. We know that there was an agreement between Allen and Cartier. Allen thought that he had bought and paid for the presidency of the CPR. Cartier knew that. Did MacDonald know it? Maybe. But uh, in Charles Tupper's phrase, he was on the drink at the time. Wonderful phrase, that. On the other hand, if he didn't know, why did he champion Allen for so long? Because there were many warning signs, you know, 
uh, Allen's uh, perfidy about American involvement in the railroad, Allen's verbal indiscretions about the agreement. I think that uh, McDonald suspected both Allen and Cartier all right, but he didn't know the details and he probably didn't want to know them. He rationalized them to sell himself and he tried to rationalize them to the country. The country wasn't buying. There was an election early in the new year. Alexander Mackenzie won in a landslide. McDonald was out. And so the railway, the great national dream, brought about his downfall. It ruined his health. It had stained his honor. It had wrecked his career. Most people expected he would simply vanish from the political scene. And maybe he expected it, too. But although John A. McDonald was out, nobody was going to keep him down for long.